Hi there, Rich Leiter here. Welcome uh, to my channel. Okay, so this is a continuation of my thoughts on The Secret Sharer by Joseph Conrad. Um, I did a little bit of research on the internet. I looked for um, some analysis by other people on The Secret Sharer and I was hard pressed to find any. Uh, there were a lot of audio versions of the story being told, but I really couldn't find very much. Just one thing, actually. Well, two things. Uh, two, two podcasts that actually uh, analyzed the story, and they were different than the, than the interpretation that I have. I, I may actually um, write an essay on this story, um, a formal essay, um, and possibly include it in, uh, in one of the books that I've written. Um, but anyway, I just want to cover a few more points that I didn't do um, in the first podcast. So I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a link to my original podcast. But here are just a few more thoughts I have about it. Now, what I what I forgot to mention is in the secret chair, the captain of the vessel, the young captain of the vessel, um, frequent frequently refers to Leggett. The person that he fished out of the ocean he refers to him as his double he actually does that has his double as his secret sharer because they both share the same uh, knowledge of the fact that the uh, legged is a fugitive but he's a double um, uh, and, and, and I think that people tend to get a little bit caught up the, the people that I've listened to in this notion of a double or a doppelganger as if Leggett is some kind of uh, sim, is some kind of um, ghostly um, uh, unreal figure uh, a part of the captain's personality and um, I mean I mean uh, you have to remember also another reason why uh, they, they are so similar is uh, all throughout the story um, the captain walks around the, his ship in his sleeping suit as he calls it, his pajamas he doesn't have any shoes on he has a straw hat and he's basically walking around the ship giving his orders wearing pajamas and when he fishes legged out of the water legged is naked and so he gives him um, he gives Leggett another pair of pajamas which look pretty much identical to the ones that the to the pajamas that the captain is wearing so both of these these characters captain and Leggett are both wearing identical pajamas uh, in identical uniform so it is very very um, um, obvious that uh, the the the, uh, the doppelganger double similarity of these two uh, figures however I would like to stress that Leggett is not merely a hallucination that the captain is having and the reason I say that is because we know as a fair fact that um, the captain of the Sephora um, the ship that Leggett was originally on um, and the ship um, on which he killed a seaman uh, was what the, the captain of the Sephora was a captain by the name of Archibald and Archibald actually boards um, you know the, the the ship that the captain is on who's hiding Leggett he boards the ship to to talk about the story of the um, of the death of the seaman on his own ship and how upset he is about it so we know for we have so we have definite uh, corroboration um, that that Leggett is not just a um, a ghost he's a real person um, as confirmed by this Captain Archibald, the captain of the Sephora. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, now, some people have suggested that um, this story is about uh, uh, the responsibility that the captain of the ship has as a captain, his role as a captain, and how he is derelict in his duty. Uh, for instance, uh, for one thing, the, the rope ladder uh, on a ship is hanging over the sides of the ship, and you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to pull, pull a rope ladder back in. It's not supposed to dangle off of, the sh off of the side of a vessel. And the captain walks around, not in his uniform, but in, in pajamas. And, of course, the most obvious thing is 
you know, when you're a captain of a vessel, your primary resp- your your primary responsibility is to your ship and to your men, the safety of your ship and the safety of your men. And um, and the captain its primary responsibility in this story is not to the to his own ship and to his own men. It's to leg it. Um, and this is the crux of it. Why is his allegiance um, immediately um, focused on this strange person that he has just fished out of the water? Um, in this sense, this story to me is a very surrealistic story. And why is it surrealistic? Why is there this almost dream, even though Leggett is a real person, why does this story have such a dreamlike quality to it and i think the reason why it does is due to the rapidity with which the captain immediately shifts his allegiance to the safety of his own ship and his own his own crew totally over to leg it it's the it's the immediate um Folk, a refocusing of his sympathies and his attention to this strange person, Leggett, that makes it so um, bizarre. I mean, it would be one thing if uh, it was a very gradual process of his um, uh, getting more and more s- sympathetic to Leggett's story, but it's a very, very rapid, abrupt um, um empathy and identification he feels with Leggett. It's almost from the very first words that they say to each other um, when Leggett is still in the water, um, he immediately feels a bond with him and they, they whisper to each other all throughout the rest of the story. So it is just so un, uh, so dreamlike, uh, this immediate, immediate um, shift of, uh, of allegiance of the captain. Um, and again, I go back to my original premise. What is the reason for this immediate sympathy with Leggett? And as I say, everybody else in the story is kind of a pig, you know, kind of a one-dimensional, flat person uh, that is just not at all attractive as a human being. Um, the first mate on on the vessel with the guy with the whiskers um he's kind of a pig you know he's just a very unsympathetic character he's always looking at these at the captain very strangely he's a person with very with you with no imagination at all and the second mate of the ship is like this young buck who is always kind of snickering uh, his 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 lips are always twitching, contorted around the captain as if he's laughing at the captain. He's also a very unsympathetic um, uh, kind of barbarian-like person. And then at one point in the middle of the story, um, Captain Archibald, who is the um, captain of the Sephora, the ship that Leggett uh, was the first mate on. Um, and uh, he boards the captain's vessel and talks about Leggett and tells the whole story about he and how upset he is about this um, this um, homicide which has transpired on his own vessel after he's being a captain for so many years. And Archibald really comes across the way that Conrad describes Archibald. He's also kind of a pig. He's a very very abrupt. Um, brusque um, person, uh, a, a very unattractive one-dimensional person. He's just very righteously indignant about how such a thing, a homicide, could have could have occurred on his ship, and this might get him in trouble and his wife in trouble. And uh, he's just beside himself with righteous indignation, and he's very flustered. Um, and he's kind of suspicious that maybe uh, maybe that this fugitive legate is actually being hidden on the ship, but he doesn't want to say it. Uh, he, he's just a very unattractive, unappealing figure. 
And as I said, I immediately got the sensation reading the story that everybody on this, uh, uh, in this story, everybody is just very unattractive, very unsubtle, very uncouth, except for the captain and except for Leggett. So there is this immediate bond that they have uh, because he's found a kindred spirit, um, a very sensitive, almost artistic soul. And uh, both, they both um, eschew the machinations of man. Um, the captain wants nothing to do with the land and, 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 the, and the, the crazy, um, hypocritical, uh, aggressive, uh, duplicitous, simple-minded nature of, of man uh, that, that, that he finds on the land. And he prefers the um, simplicity of the, the elemental simplicity, the elemental moral simplicity of the ocean to the land on which man, uh, which is blighted by man. So he wants nothing, nothing to do with man. And Leggett is, is literally a fugitive. He cannot have anything more to do with man in the way that he used to because he is now a, a fugitive. He is, he is the proverbial Cain who has killed his brother and must, and must now find a new way. Um, so that's it. Um, I, I just, I, the story really is a very, very intriguing story. If you like Heart of Darkness, I believe that you will like uh, The Secret Sharer as well. It is not, um, it's also surreal because it doesn't really have a great deal of it's not really driven by plot so much. It's much more of a psychological story. Um, it does have some plot in it. However, um, it's not the kind of a, of a plot that you're going to get in a as you would in a story by Flannery O'Connor. A Good Man is Hard to Find has a very distinct plot. It has a, it, the, the story rises to a culmination. Um, it's not like that. It's a much, it, it, as I said in the, my first podcast, the story ends rather abruptly. I was quite taken back by the fact that it just kind of ended where it did. I said, is this it? Um, but, but it is, I, I would urge you all to read it. It's so short. Um, and it is, ma and it's just a masterful story. And the more, the more that I think about it, the more masterful I think it is. It is not at all, it avoids all of the usual cliches that you might find um, in a typical sea story. Um, so that's it. Thank you.